Hey everybody. So we have a fun one today. Uh, Weaver now sells shell cordovan, so they sent us over a chunk. This is a whole shell. Um, it's a Japanese company. I know them as Ogawa, but I think they're called Letter Ogawa in total. Um, I've never used this stuff before, but we do in the shop have some Horween and we have some, I believe it's Ricotto. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna make something up out of this first because I'm not gonna just hold it in my hands and review it. Then we're gonna bring in uh, samples of the other stuff and we'll compare them and we'll be able to look back on our experience working with this in this video to talk about how they work, etc. What we're making is, I figured something fancy, um, we're gonna make a watch pouch. So this is a watch pouch that I drew up a little while ago for a watch that I had made for my mom for her birthday, which is coming up, which she doesn't know about and she watches our videos, so I probably shouldn't have said that, but hopefully she forgets to watch our videos for a few weeks. Um, it's just a simple watch pouch it holds a watch on a metal bracelet. It's a little small for um, a rubber dive strap or a leather strap that you don't want to kind of put together. Um, but the measurements and everything will be in the description on the website of the pattern. If you want to make a long, it's going to be a couple bucks. And my watch, uh, my family got this for, my, for me for Christmas. It's a Steinhardt kind of a Rolex Pepsi bezel homage. And I really like it. So I'm going to wear it. But I need a new pouch for it. So that's what we're making today. So first impressions while I'm getting ready to place the pattern, this stuff is extremely evenly finished. Um, usually shell you have like little bits and pieces of, you know, the dye because the shell is dyed by hand usually and it's multi-step process. You usually see some variation. This stuff is super even, which is kind of crazy. Um, the back, the big difference, this back is soft. Um, so if you, for those of you who don't know, Shell cordovan comes from uh, equine butt. You can make it out of horse, you can make it out of mule, you can, it's usually made out of horse, but any like donkey, zebra, etc. has shell. It's on the butt, but it's a subcutaneous layer. Is that, is that the right word? It's a big word. Is that, I, it's, it's, so they shave down the actual fiber and the shell is underneath. So it's basically like two layers of flesh and the shell in between. So usually, it's plated a bunch, which is they basically, they put it under rollers and they plate it. And this is definitely very smooth, but the back is much softer than I'm used to on any other shell that I've used, which I actually kind of like. It's also very thin. It's been split very thin, which I don't know if we ever had them do or if they do on their own. Usually, um, like a Horween shell or something, you're coming in between four and six ounces. This is definitely closer to three. So we're going to line it with some uh, Vachetta. I think this is from France, just to give it a little more thickness because it's a little too thin on its own. Uh, next thing, you have your stamp here. A lot of people make stuff stamp out. Um, that's kind of like a trend. And there used to be a guy at Horween, actually, this is going back like 10 years. They would cover the entire back of, <laughs> of their shells and stamps. It would be like 40, it was comical almost. The problem is we learned when you make stuff face out, um, the stamp rubs off. So, you know, you get, a, you get a couple weeks and it looks cool, but then it goes away and you just have backward shell. So we're gonna make this regular side, you know, front side front. Um, and we'll get into cutting it, but I'm also not going to pay attention to where the stamp is because we're going to line it. So I'm going to look more for yield than I am for um, where the stamp is. So this is a fairly simple design. Um, it's just you got to go in order and assemble it the right way because the big thing with watch pouches, I hate when they're snaps because it can scratch your watch. So this just has a little tuck thing and you just tuck that in and it stays and there's no hardware at all. Um, this is the first sample. So we're going to do it a tiny bit differently on the one that I'm making here and I'll show you. So you, if you get the pattern, you can make it no problem. But essentially, since we're lining it, we have to skive everything first. Then we need to install our little flap here. Then we need to line it and then we can put it all together. Um, you can see that this piece is straight, but this piece is kind of angled. That's how we get this to pop out like this without wet molding it. So you'll have a fully finished functional piece the minute this comes off the bench. There's no wet molding or anything to do. Um, and it fits a watch really comfortably and sturdy. Doesn't, the watch doesn't move around too much. Um, so yeah, so the first thing we're going to do is I have a line on the pattern here for where we want this piece to glue to. So I'm just going to make little marks. Now remember, you can make this online. That's totally cool. This one doesn't have a liner. It's just five ounce leather. Um, if you're going to do that, probably don't make marks in pen. 
but this is just going to show us where to skive to here. Um, and where to then we'll transfer these marks over with the scratch hole, and it's where we're going to glue everything. So I'm going to use my dividers set a little under a half inch to mark my skive line here. And on my other piece, and I'm going to leave the flap unskived so that we can get some thickness to the edge. And I'm going to leave the top unskived here as well for the same reason. And I do this before I skive just because it gives me, a, a it, it gives your, uh, your skiving knife something to catch on to, and B, it gives you a nice straight line so you can make a, basically it looks like you, a bell skiver skived it, and you're just doing it by hand. So Shell Portavin is actually one of my favorite leathers to skive because that grain is, well because it's a membrane and it's so dense it just feels like cutting through butter. But you do want to make sure that your knife is super sharp, so I just use a little bit of Jeweler's Rouge on a little bit of scrap veg, and I'm just going to get this nice and polished up, and we're not really sharpening it. This blade, all we're doing, I don't know if you can get this, you can see how that's a mirror polish. What we're doing is we're, we're basically just smoothing out all of the little tiny micro things that happen when you, when you actually use the knife. Like pits or something? Pitting, that's what it is, yeah, but it's like they're micro microscopic. And if you've never skived through Shell Cordovan, uh, you're going to want to go slow at first. Because it skives much different than regular leather because it's such a dense material. Um, it's like, it's more like cutting through clay almost. And you can see how this is the first piece that I've done in a long time. By the end of it, I got, I got it down. But it's, it gets, it's like kind of weird at first to, to get used to it. Just like any other leather, you know, every leather skives a little bit differently. Um, but, you know, just go slow, take your time, make sure you have a nice sharp knife, and you'll be good to go. Stuff like this. Um, what I'll do is I'll just come down here and I'll just cut this off because this is just kind of, it's going to be trimmed anyway. I don't proclaim to be the best with the scarving knife, just enough, just know enough to get the job done. So if you're doing a lined piece, um, we have to do this part first. Uh, if you're not doing a lined piece, you have to do this part anyway, but you're going to skip the lining, obviously. So the thing I don't like about a lot of watch pouches is they have um, metal clasps to keep them shut. I don't like that because I just always worry. This is really not, I mean it's enough protection but it's not a lot if it's floating around a bag. And the last thing you want is a piece of metal hardware getting bonked and it cracks your crystal or something like that. So it's just a strap and it tucks right into that flap. And this one I was, I didn't make it the right way but we're gonna make this in a way that it's popped up a little bit because once a watch is in here it's a little difficult to make it work. The thing is that we have to do all this in the right order since we're lining it and we want it to protect the watch from as much as we can. So before I line it, in the pattern, we have a square here, and the reason for this square is we're just gonna place little dots with our scratch hole in the four corners. That's all we need to do with this square. And now, I believe, yes, that's correct. So we're going to, nope, see, that's one of those. All right, so we just, the camera just did something weird, so I'm gonna show you what I just did again. Um, I have my two and a quarter by three quarter inch strap here. I made my regular line for my stitching chisels. I'm using a different brand, this is a crimson stitching chisel. I'm just using it to mark this out because it's got five teeth and the weaver has six and four, and I just happen to need five. This is five millimeter spacing though. Um, so once we do that, we're gonna set that aside. We're gonna bring in our front piece here. We have those marks that we made. I'm just going to connect those marks with a scratch hole. It doesn't have to be heavy, we just need to be able to lightly see them. Okay, so I'm sorry, I made a mistake. I said that this was two and a quarter inches. It's actually just under two inches. Long day. But anyway, you can see where we marked our stitching lines and where we marked our stitches here. When they match up, we're going to get just a little bit of a bump up. You might want it to look more like that, but don't because it's going to be too much. You just want a tiny slight little bump there. So now we're going to punch these all out and without any glue or anything we're just going to stitch them together. So all I'm going to do is punch these holes and I punched the three holes in the strap as well. Actually I probably should, you guys know how to, this was the least important part for me to show you. So when you're, when you're punching the strap, three quarters of an inch is perfectly sized with a five 
stitching chisel. You can do it with the six too. Um, here, we'll do it with the six in case you have the weaver chisels. Um, you can see basically you're going to have one, one prong hanging over one end and one prong hanging over the other. And that's all you want. You know, you're pretty much perfectly centered. That's all I did. And then I punched the holes. So you can see how that kind of pops up. That's what we're looking for. Now we just need to glue everything and line it. And um, the thing I like about this one is this design is nice because it, there is no wet molding or anything, so you can kind of just throw it together. Um, that angle kind of gives you all the dimension you need to just slip a watch in. But if you are one of those people that likes to wear a chunky watch, 44s, 46s, etc., just be mindful. Um, this isn't the biggest pouch design in the world. Um, if I get around to it, I'll design a a pouch for bigger watches too, but I just kind of went with, I figure not many people are wearing anything bigger than a 42 or a 44 these days, so we're not in the old Panerai world anymore. Um, but let me know if you want me to design any specific cases, because we kind of realized lately that, like, I I used to build, you don't have to like to hear this, but I used to build replica watches in, in college. I didn't sell them or anything, but, you know, it was early days of the internet, and not early, early, but early days of being able to order from, like, Alibaba and stuff, so I would buy, like, you know, cases and movements and stuff and put together my own watches that never existed from brands I couldn't afford. Um, and I just realized I kind of never really touch on watch stuff here. So I want to get into making a few more watch related things. If any of you guys and girls out there are into it, let me know what you think. We're going to do a whole line of straps. I, I have a just a little collection myself, but every like five or six years I like to make new straps for everything. So I think over the next year, every couple months, we'll sprinkle in. I want to do a different type of strap on each watch, and I have like five or six watches that need new straps. So we're going to do that, but as far as like cases or anything are concerned, if you want to see something specific, let us know. So uh, we're going to get this all stuck together, and I guess we can talk about Ogawa a little bit while we do it. Um, so I have, this is the first time I've ever used Ogawa shell, um, and I don't know a ton about them. I know they're fairly new in a sense that they haven't been doing it for a hundred years. I think they started in like the seventies. And I know they have something to do with Shinki. Like they work together or they partner together or something like that. Um, but contrary to popular belief, um, Horwing didn't invent shell cordovan, although it, in my opinion, they make the best shell cordovan you can get on the market. Um, they did perfect it, but shell's actually been around since like the like 800s, 600, something like that. What's seven? Seven century is that the eight hundreds? Eight hundreds? The eight hundreds, I think. I think you go like one number below. <laughs> okay, so seventh century, I'm pretty sure. Um, it was invented in Europe, Spain, somewhere in that area, and they used it for uh, like armor, like decorative parts of the armor. Then they used it for leather art, and then it became a household staple with uh, stroping. Stropping, I always get it wrong. They always make fun of me in the comments. Um, with strope straps for safety razors. And then once the disposable razor became a thing, um, Horween was really responsible for bringing, sort of rebranding Shell into a luxury shoe material, etc. And that is why they are sort of synonymous with the term Shell Cordovan at this point. And I will give it to them. They're the nicest Shell I've ever used to this point. Um, but this, so far, is also pretty nice. Um, so now we just need to trim this up. And I can tell you from the start, um, this shell is a little bit drier, a little more dry than Horween. Um, Horween, I think hot stuffs or stuffs a lot more oil into their shell than these guys do. Not a bad thing, it's just different. Um, I kind of like this because it's easier to glue down. Horween shell sometimes is so oily that you have to kind of rough it up and the glue won't stick that well. But, uh, you know, it's such a nice material it's worth putting up with. And we do have shell, so some Horween here. So we'll, we'll pull it out at the end and we can kind of do a side-by-side -side comparison. But so far, I think that's going to look really nice. And this Ritz, at th I don't know this color, but I'll make sure to put it in the description in the link um, where all the materials are. This matches it perfectly. So, highly suggest that combo if you're looking for a monochrome look. Alright, 
so first uh, beveling test of this stuff. Oh yeah. So if you haven't used shell before, it's like a dream to work with because it's so buttery. Um, but it's really well known for how well it burnishes. Again, just because it's such a dense material. So, so far the bevel is really good. Let's give it a burnish and see how this does. So this is just gum drag. I have this edge sanded down to about 400 grit. And I'm just going to use a cloth like we normally do. And we'll see how this burnishes up. Yeah, so I'd say it definitely gives you that sort of traditional shell burnish. It's kind of like halfway between uh, Horween shell and Veg Tan. So like it, it's a little smoother than normal, but it's not as glassy as uh, Horween or Shinky shell. All right, so I'm going to transfer these marks again on this piece, I guess. Um, like I said before, if you're going to be lining this, you want to make sure not to do this in pen because you will probably see it. And then I'm just going to, this is kind of, it's, it's Vichetta, but it's, it's got like a coating on it. So while it is natural, it's, uh, you got to rough it up a little bit before you glue. And for those of you who aren't, are fairly new to this, um, sometimes I'll rough up leather before I glue it. Sometimes I won't. And that, what dictates whether you have to rough it up or not is just basically how it's finished. So if it's a really waxy hide, if it's got a top coat on it, you usually have to rough it up. If it's a veg tan, natural veg tan, some saddle tans, if it's not too heavily oiled, you don't have to rough it up. I'm going to get this stuck in the center first, like that, on the bottom. Then I'm just going to go up each side individually. And you're probably going to have a little to sand off, but that's okay. Once I have that side done, I'm going to go to the other side. And I'm just going to stick that down as well. And it's going to look, you know, you could, so there we go. See how it's popped up? That's what we want. Don't worry about any of these little inconsistencies. We'll sand those away. But the big thing is, once we get this stuck where we want it, we want it to stay there. So make sure that you're using a really good glue, like barge or weldwood. Actually, I would now that weldwood changed their formula, I would suggest barge completely. But make sure you hammer it down as well. What happened to your finger? Huh? What happened to your finger? I cut myself on something. I don't know what, but now we're playing the, uh, playing a game of... Don't get blood on the leather. <laughs> Alright, so I have the bottom all sewn up. I like to get that done first so that it keeps its shape. The top, though, we have to add this little flappy thing here. And so what I'm going to do is I cut a three quarter inch strip of shawl cordovan. And you can see I like to leave it a little bit long so you have something to pull when you're undoing the case. And then you just tuck it in. So I'm going to start with kind of a random length and hope that it goes correctly. If it doesn't, it's fairly easy to adjust. I like to leave a lot extra. Not a lot, but I like to leave extra if I can. And I'm using the wrong. Yeah, I'll just go with the point. This is a one inch punch that I'm using on a three quarter inch strap, so. We're going to do the same thing basically that we did for um, this strap. Kind of, well, kind of, not total same. But I'm just going to punch some centered holes here. Then I'm going to choose kind of, I'm going to use my dividers here and I'm going to, I got to come down to my mat here. And I'm going to separate that by an inch. Like, that's close enough. Then, I'm going to come up here, and I'm going to make another little mark. And I'm going to punch more holes here. And remember, we're using 3 quarters of an inch because with 3 quarters of an inch and a 5 millimeter stitching iron, you can get 3 you can get a prong that hangs over each side and your three are perfectly centered. 
So now we're going to stitch the flap. But when we stitch the flap, when, when we get to the center here of the top, we're going to add this in so that you can see there we have our flap, which will work with our closure. This is obviously too long, but we can just adjust it. And we'll have a little pull tab like that that makes it easy to open. Real simple. Of course, this one isn't stitched because it's not lined. So if you make one and you don't want to line it, totally possible. I actually really like them unlined. Um, if the shell was a little thicker, I would have just made it without a liner. I forgot one thing while I was sewing. Because we're going to loop a tab around this, we got to, before we sew it, we got to edge and burnish it. Because we're not going to be able to get to it once there's a thing over it. All right, so this is how I'm attaching this tab. It's comically long, but we'll trim it. But you see, I just kind of looped it over while I'm and stitched it in. Nothing fancy. I suppose you could glue it if you wanted to, but this isn't a piece that's going to really see a whole lot of uh, pushing and pulling and all that stuff, so this should be fine. Now we're just going to finish sewing it up. And here we go. Um, so, excuse, I need to polish this. Obviously, it just came off the workbench, but... Here's our watch case. We have our nice liner. I ended up trimming that down and then watch the slides right out. So this is a cool design. The leather worked really, really well. Um, it's a, it's definitely a nice shell for sure. Um, I'm, I don't like to think I'm hypercritical, but I definitely don't recommend things without using them. And this is ver a very nice shell to work with. That's what I can tell you. Um, I can't tell you how it's going to wear because I've never, this is the first time I've worked with it, but it's shell, so it's probably going to wear pretty nicely. Um, this is our little watch case that we designed, if you want to make this, the um, patterns in the description. But what I think you all probably are waiting for, it's a comparison time. So, I have... I don't know who made this. <laughs> Someone sent this, or I ordered it somewhere. Like, I've had this for like a couple of years. It's got no markings on it, and it's gigantic. I'm not sure, though. We have the stuff that we used... And then this is a bunch of scrap of Horween that is old. You can see by the bloom, um, I just pulled it out of the scraps because I don't have any full Horween shells right now because they're kind of difficult to get. But this is the beauty of Horween shell is that it blooms and you just polish it up and you're good. So this is Ogawa's version of number eight, essentially. And this is Horween's number eight which is, of course, the original. And you can see the difference in color. The Horwing's a little bit darker. Um, and you can also see, when I was saying how this is much more um, evenly finished, um, Horwing's is hand-dyed, I believe, and it does have a lot of variation, which I love. It's not a bad thing. Um, but it is different. This is a very, just very even piece of shell. It's also, though, you can see, and this is this might be a choice. I'll have to talk to Weaver about it. The thing I do like about this is how thin it is. This is thin enough. This is like two and a half, three ounces. So you could make an entire wallet out of this. The problem with Horween shell is always that you can make an, an exterior wall of a wallet, but it's way too thick to make a regular, the interior of a wallet out of, unless you have it split down. So I actually really like that about this. Um, the miscellaneous, this is meant to look like the back of shell. It's marbled, you know. Um, the big difference with all three of these are the backs. So you see you have your Horween stamp here, you see you have your um, Ogawa stamp here, but the big difference is this is, uh, it feels almost like suede, right? This feels like a rubber eraser, I would say, similar to that. This is much, uh, much more plasticky feeling, which is, that's traditionally what the back of a shell feels like. So, um, it's different to me. It's not bad. It's just different. It feels very good. It feels awesome, but it is soft. And this is much more, and the Shinkin stuff, they're all, the backs are usually the same. So the, the thing that really stands out to me about these shells um, from Ogawa is just how soft the back is. The back is. Um, and that's probably, I'm assuming that's their tanning process, which I don't know. So, um, yeah. So, Overall, what would I say about the quality? It seems really good quality. It was very nice to work with. It works like similar to, I would say it's a bit of a drier Horween shell. That's kind of what it feels like. Um, and I had a lot of fun making stuff with it. And I'm glad we had enough shell on hand to kind of give you this comparison. Um, 
and if you want a comparison between Horween's number eight shell and this stuff's number eight, it's a little bit brighter, but keep in mind this has also been sitting around the shop, so this is probably a little darker than normal. So, given that, um, thank you guys so much for watching, and we'll see you in the next one.